Welcome. And on this video, we'll be discussing the compliance requirements pertaining to income tax and value-added tax. And we'll begin first with income tax, which has been defined in your tax one lessons as the tax on any income that is received by a person, whether you call it emoluments, profits arising from the disposal of property, whether it came from the practice of profession, conduct of trade or business, and all other pertinent items of gross income that will be included under Section 32 of the Tax Code as amended. And technically, less the deductions that will be authorized by law. Yung portion dito ng personal personal and additional expenses has already or personal and additional exemption has already been repealed by the train law so wala nang existing personal and additional exemption a person as defined under the tax code itself will include an individual a trust an estate which is similarly taxed as an individual also or a corporation the word corporation is already all-inclusive with regards all non-natural persons or juridical persons will be within the ambit of a corporation. Kaya joint stock companies, no? joint ventures, partnerships are likewise generally treated as a corporation unless, of course, there is an exemption provided for by law. Now, the characteristics of the Philippine Income Tax as to taxing authority, we consider this as national. And as to purpose, it is general because it is only for the purpose of raising revenues. And as to subject matter, it is excise because this is imposed on the privilege to earn income. And progressive as to rate, generally speaking, particularly for individuals, because we have what you call the graduated rates of 0 to 35% when we talk about income tax of individuals. But proportionate with regards corporations because it is a fixed 30% no, regardless of the type of corporation as a general rule. And direct tax as to incidence because the burden and the liability to remit the tax will fall both on the taxpayer. Okay, kaya direct. This is why it is important to study the compliance requirements because if we do not comply with any of the compliance requirements, the one who earned the income will also be the one liable for the penalties because he does not only shoulder the burden but also the statutory liability of paying the income tax. So relevant to the discussion, of compliance requirements, we'll first have a refresher, a little refresher with regards accounting periods and methods as it is provided under the tax code and the existing rules of the BIR. So there are three tests or theories that we follow in determining when a particular income will be reported as income taxable already or an expenses can be, or expense rather, can be claimed as a deduction. And that is what we call the realization test, the claim of right doctrine, and the all events test. Under the realization test, income is technically follows what we call the cash accounting method. Because income that is already received or collected now will be treated as income already in the year when it was received and deductions will be taken accordingly when they are paid. No? Unless, sabi ng tax code dito, and the existing rules of the BIR, there is another method for which to report the income and expenses that will clearly reflect the income of the taxpayer. As an example provided by them, if it is necessary to use an inventory, then no accounting will be important with regards to the purchase and the sales except the accrual method. Kumbaga, general rule, cash basis accounting tayo except if the accrual method will properly reflect the income of the taxpayer better okay and so, as an incident so, uh, as an incident to that however if the taxpayer already receives an income which has been credited to him already without any restriction ibig sabihin pwede niya ng gastusin without any condition whatsoever then it is treated as income 
derived already in that particular taxable year. On the other hand, however, an appreciation in value is not even an accrual of income, which means that it will not be reported as income just because there is an increase in the value without an actual disposal by sale or conversion of the property. Now, under the realization principle also, revenue is generally recognized when both of the following conditions are already met as enunciated in the case of Mandarin Hotel. First, the earning process is complete or virtually complete and an exchange has already taken place. Kaya dun sa kaso na binanggit natin, the deposits... No, yung mga pag ikaw ay mag-check in sa hotel, meron kang deposit amount para in case meron kang masira no, or meron kang makonsume dun sa minibar are not considered treated as income yet under the realization test because the earning process is not yet complete. Kapag na-receive ng, ng hotel yung pera, the, the, the deposits, they are not allowed to use it yet. No, because they will eventually be used to answer for the damages caused by the uh, guests or the things that they will be consuming in the mini bar. Kaya wala pang income realized on those deposits. Now, very specific, however, is BIR ruling 49-98 concerning rentals. When we talk about rentals, I know you're familiar already that there is what you call advanced rentals and there is a security deposit. Minsan, yan yung naririnig mo kapag if there are some of you who are uh, renting out, meron two months advance, two months deposit, or two months advance, one month deposit. When we talk about advance rentals, they are treated as income by the lessor already at the time they are received, regardless kahit naka-accrual method of accounting si lessor. Kaya ito yung isang nagiging reconciling item when you prepare your income tax return, naka-cash basis ang advance rentals. Whereas we follow PAS 17 with regards to the recognition of uh, income of the lessor in relation to lease payments. But sabi ng BIR dito, on the part of the lessee, the advanced rental or prepaid rentals will be treated as capital expenditure and can be claimed as a deduction only spread throughout the period of the lease na, or the remaining term of the lease, which means the lessor already recognizes it as income on his end, but the lessee cannot claim it as expense yet. No? But otherwise, it will be amortized over the remaining term of the lease. Now, on the other hand, the si security deposit naman is treated by the BIR merely the same as a loan transaction. Kaya walang income on the part of the lessor when you receive the security deposit and no expense on the part of the lessee when he pays the security deposit. Kasi nga, pwede yan gamitin na pang uh, address sa mga masisira dun sa leased premises or for other non-compliance made by the lessee in the terms of the lease. No? On the other hand, kapag binayaran or binalik na ito ni lessor kay lessee, then it will not be treated as income on the part of the lessee nor an expense on the part of the lessor. Kaya technically, when the lessor receives the security deposit, it will be lodged or recorded only as a liability. No? But it will not form part of his expenses or income and the same thing with the Lessee, even upon return of the security deposit. But of course, if at the end of the lease term, the security deposit is uh, used to apply or applied rather to the last uh, rentals of the uh, lease term, then it will be reported as income on the part of the lessor at the time it is applied as rentals. Now, take note, this is a good rule because this is the same rule that we follow even for purposes of VAT. No, not just income tax. And lastly, we have what you call the claim of right doctrine. Under the claim of right doctrine, there is an income that you've already reported. No, There is a claim of right. That's why you reported it as income already and without any restriction. That's why by law, you are treated as if you have already earned that and reported it already as part of your taxable income even though there is some contingency which means that you may or may not be entitled to na money and eventually kung ikaw ay pababa uh, ikaw ay required na ibalik 
yung pera no that you reported as income already sabi ng Supreme Court no uh, cited in the BIR ruling this is a Supreme Court ruling by the uh, US Supreme Court cited by the BIR pwede mo daw i-claim na lang as a deduction when you are asked to repay for it so kung kunwari 2020 meron kang income 10 million na ni-report under a claim of right pero may contingency na pwedeng hindi ka pa entitled naging part ng taxable income mo if in 2022 you will be asked to return the 10 million pesos, then the 10 million will be claimed as a deduction in the year it was returned. Which means hindi mo na kailangan pang i-amend yung previous return where the income was originally reported. You can just claim it as a deduction on the year where it was uh, asked to be returned no, to the other party. Inapply yan dito kasi nanalo. Supposedly, meron siyang liquidating damages, then nagkaroon sila ng kasuhan, nagkaroon na lang ng compromise settlement na mas mababa than the entitlement to the liquidating damages previously reported. Sabi ni BIR, yung excess ng nakuha mong liquidated damages na na-report as income before can now be claimed as a deduction in the year where it was asked to be returned. Now, we have also what you call the all events test, which applies to both income and expenses. So the accrual of income and expense will be permitted under this test when the following has been met. Number one, the fixing of a right of income or liability to pay and the availability of a reasonable, accurate determination of such income or liability. Take note that hindi nire require ng test na ito that there should be absolute accuracy on the part of the information required no? but only reasonable accuracy. Kaya nung in-apply ito sa kaso ng Isabela Cultural Corporation, yung kanyang mga accruals na mga professional and legal expenses. Yan, sa kanyang mga uh, retainers. No? So meron siyang binabayarang auditing firm, meron din siyang binabayarang law firm, Na ang nangyari to Lloyd, the, uh, kunwari, this is 2018, dito na render ang service, render services rendered, pero nakuha niya yung bill ng 2019 or the billing invoice for that matter. So ang ginawa ni Isabella Cultural Corporation, hindi niya pa kinlame during 2018 yung mga expenses kasi nga daw wala pang way to determine the amount no, that will be paid to the firms. But sabi ng Supreme Court, these are under retainer. No? And the idea is that monthly, fix naman ang binabayaran mo dyan sa mga firms na yan. Kaya there is a reasonable basis already to fix the amount of the expenses. And since it was not, claimed properly in 2018, then it was disallowed in the 2019 taxable year. Kasi dapat sa 2018 siya where the services were already rendered because the liability has already been fixed no? and there is a reasonable basis to determine the amount of such liability. Kaya dito sa expense in apply sa kaso na iyan. Now, the accounting periods for individuals will always be a calendar year, which means this will be any 12-month period uh, ending in December 31. Unlike for corporations who can be under fiscal or calendar year, a fiscal year will be any 12-month period ending on the last day of any other month no, other than December. So on January 31, Feb 28, March 31, April 30, yan ang fiscal fiscal year ending. Take note that individuals will always be under the calendar year while corporations are allowed to have a fiscal year kung saan mas maayos ang kanyang magiging reporting ng income. Now, computation of taxable income as a general rule will be computed based on the taxpayer's annual accounting period except if no such period is being employed or there is another method that will clearly reflect the uh, income of the taxpayer better. But that will be dependent on the opinion of the Commissioner of Internal Revenue. In short, kung ikaw naman ay naka-calendar year na, then calendar year na rin ang pag-compute mo ng taxable income. Now, in the recognition of deductions or credits, 
it will can it can follow either the accrual method or the cash method which as you already know at this point will be in accrual method we report the expenses when they are incurred and not when they are paid unlike in cash method where we follow the flow of cash itself so expenses will be reported when they are paid not when they are incurred now, with regards long-term contracts, however, ito yung mga construction normally. No? So, building or installation or construction contracts for a period in excess of one year. And dito, inaallow ng BIR or ng tax code for that matter ang recognition ng income based on the percentage of completion. So, quite literally, kung kunwari 10 million ang total contract price, kung this year 20% ang natapos, percentage completed, then only 20 million of that will be reported as revenue. No? And all the related expenditures for that period will also be claimed as the respective deduction. Nire-require lang dito na sana merong certificate man lang coming from the architect or the engineer certifying the percentage of completion and which will then be the basis of reporting the related income. Ngayon, meron din tayong tinatawag na installment basis of reporting income. This will apply in three particular instances. Number one will be sale of personal property but by dealers. Ibig sabihin, in relation to their business. Second will be casual sales of personal property. Hindi na dealers ang gumawa. And third will be sale of real property. But of course, the other two will be subjected to Conditions. Unlike dito sa sale of personal property by dealers, basta kunwari kotse, motor, no, binibenta niya on a regular basis in his uh, ordinary course of business or trade, then he will be taxable only on the portion collected, no, not the entire selling price of the car or the motorcycle, which will then be the basis of computing the gross profit realized. Okay. And the report or the basis of computing the eventual taxable income. Now, if it is the casual sale of personal property, ibig sabihin hindi done in the ordinary course of trade or business, pwede pa rin namang installment ang reporting. But it has to meet the three requirements provided here. Number one, the price exceeds 1,000 pesos. Second, the initial payments do not exceed 25% of the selling price. And third, the property would not be included in the inventory of the taxpayer if on hand at the end of the taxable year. Kasi nga dapat ang sale dito ay casual at hindi done in the ordinary course of trade or business. Initial payments as used here will be the amount of cash or property that you will be receiving within the same taxable year when the sale was made. So kung kunwari may down, may contract price ka na 10 uh, na 1 million pesos, let's say. No? Tapos meron kang down payment amounting to 200,000. Meron kang installment payments of 100,000 per month. Tapos binenta mo ito, let's say, November. So ano ang magiging initial payments mo? 200,000. And the 100,000 for November. The 100,000 for December. So the total initial payments then will be 400,000. If you divide this and get the ratio compared to the contract price of 1 million, this will be 40%. Which means hindi pwedeng mag-installment recognition kasi dapat they do not exceed 25%. Kung kunwari walang down payment, at 200,000 lamang ang iyong naging initial payments divided by the 10 million contract price. This will give you 20%. Then pwede nang mag-installment payment recognition. Ano ngayon na mangyayari? Kapag pwedeng mag-installment recognition, ang magiging basis ng computation of taxable income will be based on the actual collections lamang no? and not the total contract price. Unlike in our earlier example, kung nag-40% ang initial payments, then the basis of computing taxable income will be 1 million because the installment recognition will not be applicable. The same rule applies to real property. Ang nawala lang dito na requisite yung inventory at pangalawa nawala din yung requisite na uh, more than 1,000. So basta real property, whether it is in the relation of the business or casual sale of real property, ang requirement lamang ay the initial payments do not exceed 
25% of the selling price or the contract price in order for the installment recognition to be applicable. Okay, let's take a particular illustration to, <clears throat> to recognize or to solidify that. So S sold his lot to B for 3 million pesos for a 300,000 down payment and the balance of which is payable 100,000 per month of installment. If the sale happened in January, the initial payments will be 1.5, no, January to December, 12 months, so plus the 300,000 down payment which would make the percentage 50%. Accordingly, dahil nag-exceed ng 25%, then the entire 3 million will be the basis of computing taxable income kasi hindi applicable ang installment recognition. Unlike kung the sale happened in October, the initial payments then would be 600, 3 months not 100,000 each the installment and the down payment of 300, which will make the initial payments 20% lamang. No? And dahil it does not exceed 25%, my option na to report the income in installment where the basis of the taxable income will be computed based on the actual collections of 600,000 pesos and not the entire uh, 3 million contract or selling price. So that will be installment recognition of income, which as we have passed on already, applicable din ito, even on the sale of capital assets. Kaya may ganun ding recognition, installment recognition of the capital gains tax subject to the same rule. If you remember, this is also the same rule that we apply in regard sale of real property even if it is subject to VAT. Ganyan din ang uh, installment recognition. Now, the commissioner under the law is empowered to make any allocation of income and deductions whenever it will properly or clearly reflect the income of any organization, trade, or business. Ito yung naging basis kung bakit meron na tayo ngayon tinatawag na related party transaction documentation. Documentation. Ayan. Yan ay yung nire-require ngayon na bago ni BIR. No? Kasi <clears throat> if you have transactions with related parties, so affiliates or parent subsidiary, sister companies, the tendency, particularly if one of you uh, is uh, under a particular tax privilege, you want to exploit that. No? So kung kunwari, itong si company A ay under income tax holiday, itong si B naman ay subject to regular corporate income tax. So ang gagawin nila ngayon, kung kunwari itong si B ay bumibili, no, from A, tataasan nila ang presyo. Kasi kahit tumaas ang income ni A, wala namang magiging tax applicable, pero lalaki ang pwedeng expenses nito ni B that will be claimed in computing his taxable income. So the exploitation of this particular privilege, dahil hindi or dapat, dapat laging at arm's length. Yan ang tinatawag na description, no? ang, pri ang pricing between related parties. But if the transaction between A and B here, as we have already sa mentioned, is not at arm's length dahil tinataasan deliberately to exploit the income tax privilege of A, then the commissioner will be allowed to reallocate any income or deduction between the two parties. That is what is indicated here, no? yung allocation of income and deductions. Now, if there will be a change in accounting period, whether from fiscal year to calendar year, calendar to fiscal, or fiscal year to another fiscal year, then magkakaroon ka dito ng tinatawag na final or adjustment return for a period of less than 12 months. Quite literally, kung kunwari ikaw ay dating June 30, fiscal year ending, no? tapos nag-change ka to December 31, then yung period na ito will be covered by the final or adjustment return. And yes, far din ang tawag dyan, even in the BIR. This is not financial accounting and reporting. So, yung period covered na yan, less than 12 months, you will have to file an adjustment return. No? Kaya ito lang, sinamarize lang yung magiging returns for the short period resulting from the change in accounting period. So from fiscal to calendar, calendar to fiscal, and fiscal to another fiscal year. So lahat ng period from the last no, uh, accounting period, original accounting period that you have to the new 
ending accounting period will be covered by a final or adjustment return covering a period of less than 12 months. Now, the income here will be computed on the basis of such period which will be covered by a separate final or adjustment return. No? Kaya literal lang na parang tinitreat yung short period na ito as if it is a separate taxable year for purposes of audit by the BIR eventually. Now, the sources of income for individual taxpayers will include this compensation, uh, income from business or profession or practice of profession, passive income, and gains from disposition of property. This is, these are the four generic distinction of income. We will discuss them one by one in order to determine what will be the applicable deductible expenses that may be claimed in relation to which type of income. So for compensation income, this is everything that you received under an, an employer-employee relationship regardless of its designation. Whether you call it salaries, you call it wages, emoluments, honoraria, allowance, commission, fees, no, lahat yan are treated as compensation income. Except of course, if they can qualify as fringe benefits or those that are given on top of the usual compensation, then they can be treated or subject to FBT or fringe benefits tax when received by a manager or a supervisor or a non-rank and file employee. On the other hand, no, business or professional income will come from yung tinatawag nating self-employed individuals either because they have a sole proprietorship business or they are engaged in the practice of profession whether a solo accountant, solo practicing lawyer no, or their share in the income of a general professional partnership which is subject to income tax and expanded or creditable withholding taxes. So a professional as defined in the tax or as used in the tax code is not as limited compared to local government. No? As under the local government code, professionals are limited to those who have passed a licensure examination. No, hindi katulad dito, basta ikaw ay merong kinikita from the usual conduct of activities, it is considered already as a profession. So kung nakalagay sa Facebook profile mo ay freelance model, works at Krusty Krab, freelance model yan, pwede, no? professional pa rin ang treatment. Artista, no? considered as professional kahit walang board exam na tinitake. So it will include yun nga, anyone who engages in some art or sport for money as a means of livelihood and will then include athletes, artists, bookkeeping agents, and other recipients of professional, promotional, or talent fees. Now, income owned in common by the spouses will be divided to them equally. Kung may kotse, kunwari, na binenta, then the gain will be divided between them equally and taxable to them separately. Now, laging equal ang magiging distribution, whether income or expenses, uh, there will be no other sharing agreement that will be applicable. Laging equal. So other than that, wala na kakaibang rule with regards uh, spouses. Before, they are actually encouraged to file one tax return, which is still applicable up to now. No? Pero hindi naman talaga siya uh, technically required in the sense that you compute for the income tax of each spouse individually or separately. No? Pinagsasama lang dati para lang ma-insure na isa lang sa kanila ang nagkiklaim ng additional exemptions. Yun lang yun para nakikita ng BIR. Now, passive income, on the other hand, as the name suggests, are income arising from assets, no? but without any active conduct of, uh, well, without any activity at all. They are generated by the assets from time. No? Kaya dito papasok yung interest on your deposits, dividends on your shares of stock, kasi walang activity. Basta nakapag-invest ka na, maghihintay ka na lang ng kikitain ng asset na iyon. There are specific rates of final withholding taxes that will apply to certain types of passive income. However, if they will not be covered by the rate, no, because they do not fall within the same category or the by rules, the rates does not apply to them, then they will be subject to the regular or ordinary income tax. And lastly, you have gains on disposition of property, which as the name already implies, will be the gain that you will be deriving from the sale or disposition of assets. Whether you dispose 
capital assets, in which case you will have capital gain, or ordinary assets, in which case you will have ordinary gain. And the taxability will be dependent, number one, on the type or classification of property, and number two, whether there is a applicable capital gains tax on that particular property. But we will not delve into that anymore because that should have been discussed in length already under tax one. Now, the allowable deductions will depend on the type of income that you are deriving. So for compensation, technically, wala na. Dati ang allowable deductions lang dito will be the personal and additional exemptions. Ngayon, the only remaining deduction will be the mandatory government contributions and union juice no so yung mga SSS pag ibig fill health contributions but and only up to the maximum required by law nevertheless still a uh, person earning compensation but his taxable income did not exceed 250,000 is subject to 0% tax based on the current graduated rates that we are using on the other hand, for business or uh, business income or income from the practice of profession, uh, uh, taxpayer can avail either of the itemized deductions or the optional standard deduction. Yeah, but only as against their business income or income from profession. So kung meron din silang compensation income at the same time, hindi nila pwedeng gamitin yung mga deductions na yan against their compensation. So that the business income and the compensation income are treated as separate streams of income which will then be subjected to separate rules. No? Kaya kahit sumobra yung deductions mo dito, no, hindi mo pwedeng gamitin pa para mabawasan yung compensation income subject to tax. So itemized deductions will be those enumerated under Section 34 of the tax code which will be incurred in relation to the business or the practice of profession. Generally, that the tax base of the income tax is taxable income kaya inaallow itong mga deductions na ito. On the other hand, we have what you call optional standard deduction which will be in lieu of all itemized deduction. Ibig sabihin, pag ginamit mo ito, wala ka ng itemized deductions na pwedeng gamitin. Normally, taxpayers would use this when the uh, cost or expense ratio compared to the revenue is quite low. No? Ibig sabihin, malayo ang discrepancy ng uh, gross revenue mo at ng expenses. But of course, kung malaki-laki ang ratio ng expenses mo in relation to the revenue, better to use itemized deduction for a lower taxable income. No? Now, with regards this OSD, the purpose will be to make the EIR audit a little less complex. No? Kasi dito, ang i-audit na lang ni BIR will be the revenues and they would not have to go through the supporting documents in relation to the deductions, which may be different pa. Iba-iba, no? depending on the type of deduction that you are claiming. So kung ikaw ay naka-OSD, wala kang itemized deductions, mas madali na ang audit ng BIR. Ang titignan na lang niya is the completeness and accuracy of the reported gross sales or receipts. And of course, the items of tax credits. Now, the basis for individual taxpayers is 40% of the gross sales or receipts. Kung ang individual ay under mixed income, meaning may business income, meron pa siyang compensation income, yung business income lang ang basis ng OSD. Hindi kasali si... Uh, the basis will not yun nga, include compensation income. So dahil gross sales or receipts ang basis dito, uh, hindi ka na pwedeng mag-deduct dito even the cost of sales or the cost of services. Na, hindi pwede kasi literal na gross lang. Except the BIR actually allows the reduction of sales discounts, returns, and allowances. Kaya technically speaking, this should have been 40% of the net sales or receipts. But before deducting costs. With regards corporations, however, the basis of the 40% will be gross income which means that will be the net sales or receipts after deducting the cost of sales or the cost of services. No? Kaya gross income kapag corporation, at least for now. Kasi paglabas ng create bill, parang babaguhin ang basis ng OSD. Pag naging batas na, rather ang create bill. 
So non-resident aliens are not allowed to uh, use the optional standard deduction and you have to elect the OSD on the first quarter of the taxable year upon filing of the first quarter return and you can no longer change that. Na pagdating sa dulo, sasabihin mo, ah, mas mababa pala sana ang income tax ko kung nag-itemize deductions na lang ako, hindi mo na pwedeng baguhin. That's why you have to plan it and project it properly at the beginning of the year palama. So, third type of deduction, so you have already is a compensation income and the itemized deductions in OSDs in relation to the business or profession income. You also have special allowable itemized deductions provided by special laws. Dito rin papasok even the senior citizen discount, PWD discount, now that you will be, kahit discount ang tawag nila, they are actually claimed as itemized deductions and not as a reduction to the gross sales to arrive at gross uh, at net sales. No? Kasi itemized deductions or operating expenses yang senior citizen discount and PWD discount. And for individuals that are earning purely from business and or practice of profession, availing of the 8% flat rate, the first 250000 of their sales or receipts will not be taxable. Of course, pag ikaw ay naka 8% flat rate, hindi ka na pwede either the itemizer OSD kasi nga ang 8% flat rate ay nakabase na sa net sales or receipts no yun lang basis niya kaya you cannot you can no longer claim any other deduction other than 250,000 if you are purely earning from business or profession in short kung ikaw ay mixed income earner wala ring 250,000 na deduction even on your income from business or profession yun nga all right so now we go to the filing of the individual income tax returns Okay, for individuals who will be filing the income tax returns, meron tayong annual income tax returns depending on the type of income or types of income that you are receiving. If you are earning purely from compensation, then the BIR form that you will be using will be BIR form 1700. So ang point din dito is that you are not qualified for the substituted filing, maybe because nag-resign ka at nagkaroon ka ng pangalawang employer within the same taxable year, so you will be required to consolidate all your compensation income and report them through BIR Form 1700. But if you are in earning from business or practice of profession or a mixed income earner, then you will be using BIR Form 1701, including individual income tax of estates and trusts. Yan din ang BIR Form na ginagamit. The deadline for the filing of either 1700 or 1701 will be April 15 of the succeeding year. Take note, laging nakakalendar year ang individual, kaya laging December 31 ang end ng kanyang taxable year. And April 15 will be the generic deadline for all individuals. Now, substituted filing of income tax return will be applicable to those earning compensation income, which means na substituted na the employers will be the one to file the tax return for them. That's why the individual employees need not file their own ITR. And will be the requisites for this to apply will be number one, receiving purely compensation income, wala kang income from business or profession, and the amount of tax has been correctly withheld by the employer and remitted to the BIR and there is only one employer during the taxable year. Pag lahat yan na meet na, then the BIR Form 2316, which is technically a certificate of withholding tax that you will receive from the employer, will constitute as the ITR already of the employee. Hindi niya na kailangan mag-file pa ng sarili niyang 1700 now, under the law, there can be installment payment of income tax whenever the tax due is in excess of 2,000 pesos. And you can pay this in two equal installments, one at the time the return is filed on or before April 15, and the other installment on or before October 15. Required ba na laging equal? Hindi naman. Basta mas malaki yung first installment. Paano kung kunwari 8,100? Pwede mo nang bayaran yung 4-1 in the first installment and the remaining 4,000 on the second installment. Hindi naman kailangan laging equal, but you may opt to pay it equally. 
Okay. Now, who will be required to file an ITR? Individuals receiving compensation from two or more employers, whether they are concurrent or successive. So, kunwari, January 1 to June 30, nandito ka kay employer A, tapos nag-resign ka, nag-start ka kay employer B, July 15 to December 31. Nevertheless, dito, no, dalawa ang iyong employers, kaya you have to file your own income tax return. But since both are coming co are considered rather as compensation income, then what you will file here is BIR Form 1700. Na kasi purely from compensation pa rin ang iyong income. Employees deriving compensation income, whether from a singular several employers, but the income tax has not been withheld correctly in order to correct no, the liability. And individuals deriving income other than compensation kasi pag may business or income from the practice of profession, talagang required mag-file using 1701. And individuals whose spouse is required to file an ITR, isasama ka na dun sa ITR ng spouse. And non-resident aliens engaged in trade or business in the Philippines will be required to file their own ITR as well. Now, aside from the annual income tax return, meron ding quarterly income tax return na dapat file. in which case it will be 1701Q. Na? Hindi naman na nakakalito. The annual is 1701, which means that in the 1701Q, you don't report quarterly compensation income. What you report in the quarterly income tax return here is only the income arising from business or from the practice of profession. Otherwise stated, kung ikaw ay purely compensation income earner, you need not file a quarterly income tax return. Para lang ito sa mga nag earn ng business income or income from the practice of profession. And the deadline will be for the first quarter, May 15, second quarter, August 15, and third quarter, November 15. Pag maganda pag individuals, naka-fix na. No? Hindi ka tulad pag corporations, merong period na bibilangin mo pa. And ito, ito lang ang binago ng train law, ginawang May 15. Kasi before the train law, that used to be April 15 also. Kaya dati, nagpa-file ka ng annual ITR mo for the previous taxable year, pina-file mo na rin kagad yung first quarter return for the new taxable year. Pero ginawa na yung May 15 under the train law. The manner of filing can either be manual, so literal na pinilapan mo yung form manually or at least yung Excel file, then tsaka mo pinrint, tapos dadalin mo ngayon yan sa authorized agent bank no? or yung banko within your reg revenue district office. Ka, then doon mo file para sila na magsa-stamp and doon ka na rin magbabayad ng ng tax due. In fact, kahit yung mga guard, pwede mo tanongin dyan. No? Na kasi pagpasok mo pa lang, pwede po bang magbayad dito ng BIR? Tatanungin ka na kagad ng guard kung anong RDO. No? Kung anong RDO. Now, you can also file through the electronic filing and payment system, but there are specific taxpayers who are actually required to file their returns and pay the corresponding tax due through the EFPS. No, kasama dyan yung mga top 20,000 corporation, yung mga covered ng TAMP, uh, yung mga large taxpayers, yan. Nire-require sila na mag-electronic filing and payment system. So sa website mismo ng BIR, you can access the EFPS system, input ng password, username, password, security, question, and then you will choose the return that you will be filing. Doon mo na rin fifilapan. At Iva validate, no? tapos tsaka isa submit then filed na. Tapos tsaka magkakaroon ng prompt for the electronic payment, kaya i-enroll mo din ang iyong banko kung saan manggagaling ang payment. Or it can be done through EBIR forms, which technically is manual pero semi-electronic because you can download the EBIR forms in the BIR website itself. No, once na-install mo na yan sa laptop mo, except sa mga MacBook users, walang version for MacBook, Doon ka na mag-fill up, pwede mo na rin i-validate and pwede mo na rin i-submit electronically. Makaka-receive ka na lang niya ng email confirming the um, the the filing of the return, then you can now pay either through Land Bank or through GCash actually, no pwede. But you can also have it printed and go to the authorized agent bank in order to pay the corresponding uh, tax liability. Kaya medyo yung EBIR forms ay gitna ng manual at ng EFPS. 
Now, for the corporate returns, the annual income tax return will be BIR Form 1702. Di ba, hindi mahirap kasi 1700 purely compensation, 1701 business and practice of profession, 1702 corporate income tax return. And kung ikaw ay exempt corporation, ang tinatawag ay annual information form, which is technically the same format no, ng annual income tax return. Ang pinagkaiba lang niyan, walang tax due. Kasi nga exempt, corporation or partnership. Kaya literal lang ito na parang information form kasi wala namang babayarang tax liability. The deadline will be on or before 15th day of the fourth month following the close of the taxable year. So kung December 31 ang iyong close ng taxable year, the fourth month there will be April and the 15th day of April will be 15. No? Kaya lang ganito ang wording pagdating sa corporate tax uh, return deadline dahil pwede silang naka-fiscal year. Unlike kapag individuals na laging calendar year, laging April 15 ang kanilang 15th day of the fourth month following the close of the taxable year. So, kung kunwari ikaw ay um, sabi natin June 30 ang iyong year ending, no? then fourth month from there will be July, August, September, October. October 15 will be the deadline for the filing of the annual corporate tax return. Alright? Now, <clears throat> The rule on installment payment, yung kapag more than 2,000 ang tax due, does not apply to a corporation. Pang individuals lamang yung uh, rule na yan. And the quarterly income tax return will be filed 60th day, on or before the 60th day following the close of the taxable quarter. Quite literally, number of days ang bibilangin natin dito. So if your first quarter, for example, ends March 31, then you will count 60 days from that. April has 30 days. Then May has 31 days pero 30 pa lang yan, 60 na ang natapos. No? Kaya May 30 will be the deadline, not necessarily May 31. Kaya yung days, does not yung 60 days does not necessarily translate to 2 months. No? Kasi literal na number of days ang iyong bibilangin. So it follows also June 30, June 30 return. Kung ikaw ay naka-calendar year, June 30 will be your second quarter. The... The 60th day following the close of June 30 then will be August 29. Kasi yung July mo, naka 31 days na. So para maging 60, 29 days lang ang kailangan sa August. Kaya literally yan, number of days ang bibilangin natin. So meron lang din for every income tax return that you file, whether quarterly or annual, dapat laging may kasamang South or the summary alphabetical list of withholding taxes at source. It's a mouthful but literally it only contains all the income subjected to withholding tax received no, by the taxpayer. So lahat ng income niya na sinabject ng payors to withholding taxes, gagawa niya ng summary. No? And dapat banggayan dun sa revenue na nire-report mo per income tax return. And some common issues that we will be encountering when we audit a particular uh, taxpayer in relation to income tax will be number one, hindi tied up ang income na reported per trial balance or even for financial statements and per income tax return. So pinagko-compare yan ni BIR, hindi tugma ang income mo per trial balance. Of course, dahil nagkakaroon ng differences in treatment pag accounting and pag tax. No? Kaya ito kailangan pang i-reconcile. This can be any other type or any other uh, item used in the computation of income. So kung kunwari sales, hindi bangga ang sales, hindi bangga ang expenses, yan din ang ginagamit na basis. No? With any difference that will be noted by the BIR will be a ground for an assessment, which, you will, which will then require the taxpayer to reconcile. No? reconcile. CWT credits, claim, do not tie up with the South kasi sabi nga natin, yung uh, income subjected to the withholding taxes should be reported in the South. Kaya kung hindi tumugma yung income reported and the income that is uh, actually included in the income tax return, then finding na in the same way na yung creditable withholding taxes mo na kiniklaim as tax credits, kung hindi nagtugma sa summary ng withheld taxes, then that is that's it, that will also be a finding by the BIR. Late filing, no? pag hindi mo na file within the uh, deadline required or wrong venue, 
Dahil require ka na EFPS pero file mo manually or file mo through the EBIR forms or kung kunwari RDO 38 ka pero file mo sa banko na nasa RDO 39. Yeah, wrong venue which will then be a ground also for 25% surcharge. Agad-agad, no? Kaya kailangan din nag-iingat tayo diyan. Na income subjected to final withholding taxes but they are not supported by BIR form 2306 which is the certificate of final taxes withheld. Ang ginagawa diyan ni BIR kung meron kang kunwaring interest income subject to final tax, 'di ba? Hindi na natin sinasama sa ating income tax return. Pero dahil walang 2306, ititreat siya ni BIR as if there was no withheld final taxes. Kaya kailangan kinukuha natin ang mga 2306 from the income payors. Now, tax exempt income not supported by certificates of exemption. Although we can argue here that even the CTA allows the income to still be exempted as long as you can present proof other than a certificate of exemption. Pero to be on the safe side, we normally require uh, the taxpayers to secure a BIR certificate of exemption para lang mas sigurado na pag in ni BIR, hindi niya Pwede natin sabihin na ikaw na mismo ang nagsabing exempt yung income na iyan. Recoveries from right of accounts na nakalimutang isubject sa income tax subject to what we call the tax benefit rule. So kung dahil kung bumaba ang binayara mong income tax from the previous year nung nag-claim ka ng written of accounts, pag na-recover mo yan, dapat magiging taxable income sila. Provisions and accruals that are claimed as expenses but they are not subjected to withholding taxes dahil generic requirement under Section 34K that all income subject to withholding taxes should be subjected to the appropriate withholding taxes prior to them being claimed as expenses. Now, very strict. Even the Supreme Court has already upheld this. Kaya kung ikaw, ay mag, uh, kung may provisions or accruals ka pero hindi mo pa alam kung magkano ang actual amount niya talaga without reasonable accuracy, then it would be better to treat it as a temporary difference or a reconciling item for the period para hindi mo muna withholdan ng tax. Surcharges and compromise penalties that are claimed as deduction kasi they are not deductible penalties No, dahil hindi naman yan ordinary and necessary in the conduct of trade or business. Prepaid rentals, not claimed as expense at the time of payment, but you can argue here actually, no, ito kasi usual findings namin ito when you do tax audit, tax compliance audit in auditing firms. Pero you can argue by our ruling that we have mentioned earlier that it has to be spread out during the remaining term of the lease. Retirement expenses based on PAS 1919. Kasi ito dapat i-compare mo muna with the current service cost, yung actual contributions, which I suppose was discussed with you already in Tax 1. If actual contributions will be higher, then the excess will be treated as past service cost that you need to amortize over a period of 10 years. Loss on foreclosure claimed as deduction because foreclosure is not a taxable event. Na, for tax purposes. Pag nag-expire na ang period of redemption or there's actual resale of the property, tsaka lang nagkakaroon ng taxable event. Interest expense that is claimed based on effective interest rate because for tax purposes, we follow only the nominal interest rate. Na, wala tayong pakialam sa premiums and discounts. For tax purposes, whatever is the stipulated rate of interest, na nominal interest, yun lang din ang masusunod for interest income and for interest expense recognition. And CWT credits not supported by the BIR Form 2307 or the CWT certificate, na quite straightforward dahil uh, CWT credit yan pero hindi mo nila, hindi supported ng 2307 as if walang proof na talagang meron kang tax credit. CGT and FWT claim as deduction. These are not deductible taxes because they are treated as income tax. Kaya hindi yan nagiging part ng deductible taxes under Section 34C. Na? Kasi dapat related to the business lamang except income tax na kalagay. 
unsupported expenses or deficient supporting documents. Pinag-isa na lang natin pero pagdating sa practice, medyo marami-rami kang mahanap dito. Either donations, walang certificate of donation, or wala yung mga invoices or receipts or any other proof that you were able to incur the expenses that you are claiming as a deduction. Ear expenses that were not subjected to the limit, no, kasi yung 1% or 0.5%, depending kung sale of goods or sale of services, hanggang dun lamang ang pwede nating i-claim as ear expenses. Kaya yan yung isa sa mga procedure na ginagawa for tax audit. No? Kinocompute natin yung limit para matignan kung yung ear na na-claim, ear expense na na-claim is within the limit allowed by the BIR rules. And losses deducted from the gains in computing gross income, particularly for MCIT computation, kasi sa MCIT gross income includes all other operating income, even the non-operating income for that matter. Pero kung konare net trading gain, meron kang trading gains, meron kang forex gains as a rule, hindi mo pwedeng i deduct yung mga trading losses, forex losses. No? Kasi income lang ang sinasama sa computation ng gross income for MCIT and costs. Kaya hindi nagiging treated as costs yung mga losses na iyan. And non-computation of MCIT on a quarterly basis. So you have to take note that since we compute for the RCIT liability on a quarterly basis, we compute the MCIT on a quarterly basis as well. Kaya tinitignan na natin even on a quarterly basis kung higher ba si MCIT kay RCIT. And that will be the portion for income tax. And at this point, we'll be discussing now the value-added tax compliance requirements. So first thing that you have to take note with regards VAT no, is that VAT, among the other taxes, is highly document-driven. When the law requires a certain type of document as a particular support for a particular transaction, no other type of document is being allowed by the BIR. And no other proof will be taken even by the Court of Tax Appeals. Kaya dito nagsisimula sa compliance requirements will be the required supporting documents. So each type of transaction will require a specific type of document. And kung mag-iba na kagad ang iyong document, then hindi na iya allow. Either on the part of the seller, magkakaroon na siya kagad ng administrative liability for the incorrect supporting document but more so on the buyer he cannot he cannot claim the input tax credit because of the error or the erroneous supporting document that he has so number one for domestic purchase of goods VAT invoice wala nang iba no? kung ikaw ay merong VAT OR merong kang billing invoice statement of account kontrata no or 100 other documents you cannot claim the input tax credit hangga't walang VAT invoice for the purchase of goods ganyan ka strict no even in input VAT refund cases that we have handled before the CTA kung importation of goods nire-require ni BIR na dapat merong import entry declaration plus the official receipt coming from the Bureau of Customs proving the payment of the VAT yun nga lang ngayon dahil naka e-system na or may system na computerized system na ang BOC ang ginagamit na nila ngayon is the Statement of Settlement of Ta Duties and Taxes or the SSDT and Single Administrative Document to replace the Import Entry Declaration and the BOC Official Receipt. For purchase of real property, VAT invoice din generally ang requirement dahil purchase of goods din ito plus a public instrument. Now, the deed of sale or the deed of absolute sale kailangan notarized per BIR requirements. For services, VAT official receipt will be the requirement. Same with the purchase of goods. Kung kunwari ikaw ay merong invoice, meron kang statement of account, kahit meron ka pang mga bank memo, bank credit memo, debit memo, no? hindi yan tatanggapin ng BIR hanggat wala kang VAT OR. Transitional input tax will require the inventory list submitted to the BIR. And in transactions deemed sale, the invoice also will be the requirement as provided under RR 16-05. And <clears throat> with regards purchase of services from non-residents, yung mga tinatawag nating withholding VAT, BIR Form 1600 ang ifa-file ng... <laughs> 
So ito yung mga merong non-resident surrender service in the Philippines which will then be subject to VAT pero dahil sila ay non-residents, we cannot expect them to file their own VAT return. Kaya by law, nire-require si payor na withholdan yung payments niya ng withholding VAT. Then the payor will be the one to remit the same to the BIR and using BIR form 1600, yung BIR form 1600 na rin ang kanyang supporting document for the input tax credit. For advanced VAT on sugar, that will be the payment order. And with regards to the final 5% withholding VAT on sale to government, the withholding certificate, which is also 2307. Now, 2307 then. Now, more importantly also will be the rules on the cash machines or uh, uh, tape receipts rather, or tape invoices. So nakita nyo sa mga mall, uh, sa mga 7-Eleven, ganyan. No? Yung mga nilalabas ng cash register machines, those are what we call the tape uh, receipts or tape invoices for that matter. And they are valid supporting documents still as long as they comply with all the necessary information required to be indicated under Section 113 and 237 of the tax code, which we will discuss in a while. So the BIR already held, yun nga, and consistently even the Court of Tax Appeals that VAT invoices will be for seller of goods, VAT ORs will be for seller of services, and hindi sila pwedeng pagbalik ta rin. So accordingly, input VAT on sale of goods, kahit pa meron kang VAT OR, pero statement of account and other supporting documents, but you don't have a VAT invoice, then you cannot claim the input tax credit. Kaya again, going back to our straight statement earlier, VAT, is a highly document-driven type of tax. No? And if there is a specific requirement or specific documentary requirement by law, yun lang ang pwedeng gamitin for each type of transaction. No? And hindi pwedeng pagpalit-palitin. Hindi katulad pag income tax, ang generic requirement lang is that it is supported. No? Merong document supporting the expenses. Pero pag VAT, very strict kung ano yung type of document na pwede nating gamitin. Now, what will be the information required in the VAT support? And at this point, number one, lahat ito ay kailangan. Mawala lang isa, technically invalid na ang supporting document. Kaya ganyan ka stricto no? pagdating sa VAT. So the statement that the taxpayer is a VAT registered person, so either yung TIN niya, kunwari 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and the branch code 000. So either dito nakalagay yung word na VAT or dito nakalagay yung word na VAT. Basta may statement na VAT registered yung seller. No? Second, the total amount that will have to be paid and that, uh, that amount is inclusive of VAT. And the VAT itself must be shown separately. Kaya you will notice, no, pag ikaw ay bumili kahit sa mga Green Hills, Green Hills, or yung mga stores sa gitna ng mall, dinidivide nila by 1.12 because they have to indicate in the OR or in the invoice separately the amount of the VAT uh, that will be paid by the taxpayers. Kaya kung kunwari, no, meron kang binili for 112 pesos, 112 ang total, literal na dapat nakasulad dyan the, the purchase amount is 100 and the amount of VAT is 12 pesos. Ito yung sinasabi nating VAT must be indicated separately. And yes, this has already been used by the CTA as a ground no, to disallow the amount of VAT that is being claimed just because hindi dahil hindi na ilagay separately yung amount ng VAT pwede nang i-disallow or magkakaroon ng improper supporting document now if the transaction is VAT exempt or zero rated the same must be indicated in the invoice or in the OR because otherwise it may uh, subject the seller to VAT liability now, in, in, in the case the amount of the sale is 1,000 pesos or more, other than the other requirements, kailangan nakalagay din yung information ng buyer, no? including his name, business style, address, and TIN. Yung business style dito has been clarified in 2020 by the BIR as pertaining to the trade name. So kung konwari, meron kang uh, coffee specialist, ink. Yan ang iyo talagang kumpanya. No? But you are a franchisee of uh, Starbucks. Then Starbucks will be the trade name. 
or business style. No? Kung ano yung sikat na alam ng mga tao or trade name, then yun ang iyong business style. But the name of the purchaser will still be coffee specialist. The registered name with the B-I-R-N-D S-E-C. Now, the date of the transaction, for pagdating sa goods, no? sa goods, the date of the transaction, quantity, unit cost, and description. Pagdating sa services, nature of the service will be a requirement. And yes, the CTA already, no? before magkaroon dito ng input VAT refund case, uh, pinayagan ng CTA initially ang refund in the amount of 230 million pesos. Tapos nung nag-object si BIR, nag-motion for reconsideration saying that most of the receipts do not indicate the nature of the services binago ng Court of Tax Appeals. Naging 2.3 million na lang ang naklaim na input tax credit just because the nature of the services was not indicated in the supporting document. And of course, in all instances, the name of the buyer must be indicated in order to determine who is entitled to the input tax. In fact, Meron pang isang CTA case din ito na nagpalit ng pangalan si buyer then yung invoice or OR niya ay nakapangalan pa sa lumang pangalan hindi rin inalaw ang input tax credit. Kasi dito conservative ang court, even the BIR to the point na baka may ibang mag-claim ng input tax credit. na Kaya din it is allowed na lang whenever there's an error on any of the information required in the VAT supporting document. Now the deadline for the filing of the VAT return will be uh, 20th of the day, 20th day following the close of the month for the monthly VAT return and with regards quarterly VAT return 25th day following the close of the quarter but take note ito ay uh, cumulative na so kung kunwari January February so ang deadline mo dito sa uh, monthly return for the monthly return will be February 20 March 20. Pero pagdating ng March, first quarter return na lang ang ifa-file mo dito. No? And the first quarter return will include also the information relative to the January-February transactions. Kaya cumulative. The quarterly returns will be the one that is required by law. Yung BIR Form 1600 for withholding VAT is filed on the 10th day following the close of the month. No? Monthly yan. And in the train law, sabi beginning January 1, 2023, wala na tayong monthly filing ng VAT return. Lahat quarterly na. No? And 25th day will be the generic deadline. Now, also a requirement will be the supporting summary lists of sales and purchases. And quite literally, as the name suggests, no, this will summarize and list all of the sales made by the taxpayer or all of the purchases made by the taxpayer. Kasi yan, kung kunwari itong si A, nagbenta kay B, so seller ito, o gawin na lang natin S para mas madali. Nagbenta kay B, no? and but registered sila pareho. So itong transaction na ito, ire-report ni S sa kanyang summary list of sales at ire-report naman ni B sa kanyang summary list of purchases. Quite literally, every quarter, no? nakalista lahat ng transaction. So si S nire-report niya na nagbenta siya kay B, si B nagre-report siya na bumili siya kay S. Kaya pag nag-audit si BIR, kunwari in-audit niya itong si S, itong SLS niya palalakarin lang sa relief system, yan yung sinasabing relief system ni BIR which is a computer uh, aided auditing technique, no? And lahat ng SLP kay B, kay C, lahat ng taxpayer ay iraran sa system para pag nagkaroon ng hindi tugma, no, nagiging subject na ng letter notice. Binibigyan na ng love letter yung taxpayer and asking him to explain the difference noted with regards the reporting. Naging controversial ito in 2012 kasi ni-require ito sa lahat ng VAT registered taxpayers. Kasi dati, Ang record lang na meron nito kapag ang quarterly sales mo ay more than 250,000. Ngayon, beginning 2012 actually, lahat are required na. Which became controversial kasi for example, si 7-Eleven or my bakery, ba? Bibili ka lang ng kakarampot. Kunwari sabi mo lang sa 7-Eleven, pabili po ng chewing gum. Sabi sasabihin ng dapat dapat ang sasabihin ng ng cashier Ano po ang pangalan nyo? Ano po ang TIN? Ano po ang registered address? Kasi lahat ng information na yan are required to be indicated in the summary list of sales. No? I don't know how the BIR 
uh, would go around that particular requirement, particularly for the retailers. Now, some common issues that we may encounter with regards to compliance to VAT requirements. So same lang, late filing and wrong venue for the VAT returns. Either hindi ka nag-meet ng deadline or manual filer ka or rather EFPS filer ka pero manually filed or maling revenue district office ang pinag-filan mo ng return. The amount per return, do not tie up with the summary lists. So dapat yan laging tutugma. Kasi lahat ng summary list of sales mo will include vatable transaction, even zero-rated transaction, exempt, and those that are sold to the government. Which in turn will be the line items you will be reporting in the VAT return. Kaya kapag hindi nagtugma yan, no, even the summary list of purchases and the amount of purchases that you recorded or reported in the VAT return, then finding na kagad yan ni BIR. Kaya procedurally, ang ginagawa tuloy na sa practice is that you prepare the summary list first bago mo ilagay sa VAT return. No? Para sigurado na laging tutugma ang mga amounts. Na payments to non-residents were not subjected to withholding VAT. Quite straightforward, no? Other income not subjected to VAT, ito yung medyo broad pa. No? Kasi yung definition ni BIR ng gross income is all the receipts or income that you earned less only the costs. Kaya technically, all other types of income yet that you derive must be included in what can be subjected to VAT. No? Uh, ito yung magpo-flow dun sa concept ng incidental transactions. Okay? Kaya dapat sinasubject to VAT. Improper recognition period of sales or purchases. Kasi if we're talking about sale of goods, the recognition of the VAT will be on the consummation of the sale, which is normally the delivery as indicated in the invoice. With regard services, however, even lease transactions, the recognition of the VAT, whether the input VAT or the output VAT, will be upon payment no? and not when the services are rendered, upon payment lang. Kaya minsan nagkakaroon ng ibang period recognition kasi kunwari services performed in December but paid in January, report na kagad siya as input tax on the fourth quarter pero wala pang payment. Kaya kailangan January sana siya report as input tax credits. Improper supporting document, no, taking into account the required supporting documents and the required information required to be indicated there. And the point that dapat original, pinagbabawalan ni BIR kahit photocopy man lamang. Dapat daw laging original. Kaya nga, there was one point when the BIR required the use of non-thermal paper. Kaya mapapansin nyo may nagkaroon ng moment na yung resibo mo parang magaspang no kasi pinagbawal ni BIR yung mga thermal papers kasi mabilis mawala yung information na bubura yung information na nasa resibo or invoice incomplete or erroneous information sabi natin mawala lang yung name magkamali ng tin mali ang address no or nagpalit ka ng name or wala man lang yung amount ng VAT no or the VAT is not separately indicated then improper supporting document which may result to administrative liability for the seller or on the part of the buyer disallowance of the input tax credit now you will remember also in your tax too that purchase of capital goods of more than 1 month the aggregate cost of which exclusive of VAT is more than 1 million in 1 month dapat amortized ang input tax credit over a period of 60 months or the economic useful life, whichever is shorter. Pag hindi mo yung ginawa at can lay mo ang input tax uh, outright, then magiging finding din yan ni BIR. Now, the VAT OR or invoice is issued for a non-VAT transaction. Dito, you can be subject to both 3% OPT and at the same time to the 12% VAT. This is the only instance na nagiging 15% ang business tax na babayaran mo. The VAT will be a penalty. Kasi supposedly non-VATable yan, but you issue the VAT OR or VAT invoice, ang sabi ng Supreme Court, baka daw kasi mag-claim ng input tax credit yung buyer. Pero if it is a non-VAT transaction to begin with, then there will be no separate amount of VAT indicated. Diba? Hindi madidisallow na rin. Pero yan ang nakalagay sa tax code. Plus a 50% surcharge. No? Kaya kailangan nag-iingat. Pag non-VAT transaction, dapat non-VAT din ang OR or invoice. 
Failure to allocate common input taxes, particularly kung meron kang mga mixed transactions. So, meron kang batable sale, um, zero-rated sale, exempt, and those sales to the government. And there are specific purchases that you cannot specifically identify kung saan activity-related dapat ina-allocate mo ang input tax based on the uh, sales exclusive of VAT. No? Kasi nga, Iba-iba ang paggamit natin ng input tax depende kung saan sila related. Kung related sa vatable sales, pwede mong gamitin as tax credit. Kung related sa zero rated, pwede mong i-claim as tax credit or i-refund. Pag exempt sales naman, kailangan lang siya cost or expense but not as an input tax credit. And that concludes our discussion for the income tax and VAT compliance.